Good morning and welcome to Oikos. It's good to be here. Uh, we are continuing in the book of Hebrews. And first of all, I just want to thank you all that we've been doing communion before the message for such a long time, almost a year now, and it still isn't in my head, so thank you for being patient. But I always think we still have something else to do other than me continuing the service. So as we get into Hebrews, one of the things that we're going to look at is a full commitment to Christ. And there was a study I read this last week. It was a study about reading the Bible. And it surprised me. So if you read the Bible once a week, the study found in the participants that were in this study, there wasn't really any significant change. So imagine, you know, you go, oh man, it's Monday, I've got a lecture time, I'm going to read the Bible. Well, this study found in those participants, there wasn't a lot of change. I'll tell you, that kind of disappointed me. I was like, really? They found that if you read it twice or three times, so you go, I'm going to read it Monday, Wednesday, Friday there still wasn't really any life change. These participants kept doing the same things that they were doing before. But it found that those who did it daily saw exponential change. And this was not like a little bit. Over 300% of their routines changed. Exponentially. These individuals were less likely, based on other people in society as well, if they read their Bible daily, almost by 300% less likely to be lonely. Think about that. That's one of the number one things in our society. These people, almost 300%, were less likely to view pornography. That's a huge thing because it's so accessible. Over 300%, and it's so addictive. Think about that. Someone who's got a rhythm of viewing things that are not of God begins reading the Bible daily, and that person, over 300% more than someone else, will stop. These people are 300% less likely to suffer from anxiety. Pretty significant. But not only that, these people are over 300% more likely to share their faith. So, when you wonder why a church isn't growing or why Christian culture is declining. Maybe there's something to it. Full commitment is what we're going to look at today. Because there's clear evidence that when the Word of God is in your daily routine, is in your daily rhythm, exponential change is possible. So the more you engage with Jesus, perhaps the more committed to Christ you are instead of the world. There's a great quote from C.S. Lewis in the book Mere Christianity. The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make them little Christ. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. Reconciling ourselves to him, to become like him. 
So what does it mean to be a little Christ? We're going to take a moment. I want you to reflect on that. What does it mean to be a little Christ? What would it mean for you right now as you walk out this door today to be a little Christ? What does it look like? Talk at your tables for one or two minutes. I promise today that the sermon's not super long because we have a congregational meeting afterwards. So I am watching the time, even if KC thinks I'm not. So, a couple minutes. What does it mean to be a little Christ? And it's okay if you don't have an answer, if you're kind of like, I don't even really know what that means. We'll talk about it. Okay, if you've got something that you heard at your table that you want to have it public, just raise, just say it. I'll repeat it so the people online can hear it. Emulating, imitating, so that so that others who don't know you see Jesus, and that those who do know. Jesus, I mean, who do know you, know Jesus, or see Jesus in you. Emulating, imitating. Anybody else? Okay, so the, the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. So people see you doing something. Another great words of Jesus, right? I'll sum up all the commandments and these two sentences. What else? Okay, so there's a big thing, and this actually goes throughout Scripture. We seek independence in life, but God's calling us to dependence on Him. Not dependent on anything else, not your bank account, not your job, not your status, not your fame, or how many people like you, but dependent on him. Thank you, Dave. And it's really uncomfortable if you didn't hear that. It's really uncomfortable to be in a situation where you feel like you should be able to get yourself through it and then realize you have to become completely dependent on him. Great, great things. Okay, let's look at this quotation from our good old buddy Martin Luther. We are not yet what we shall be, but we're growing toward it. The process is not yet finished. That is the journey of becoming a little Christ. We are not yet what we shall be. I want you to hold on to that. you're disappointed a lot of us are (laughs) if you get upset that why can I not yet do this you're in good company if you say yeah that confession where my treasure is if I'm honest and I actually say where the treasure is My heart's not necessarily with Jesus all the time. And I wish it was. Martin Luther says, we're not yet what we shall be. Almost in a sense of saying, don't worry. The Lord is doing a good work in you, and we're growing toward it. The process is not yet finished. So today we're going to read a section of Hebrews. And this section, the author has already up to these the fifth and sixth chapters has talked about the history of god he has talked about how powerful he is he's talked about what he has done he's talked about having faith in him the author again i'm using he it could very well be priscilla and aquila it could be just priscilla 
the author is writing this book to a bunch of people who were and are Jews who now believe in Jesus as the Messiah. They have a whole bunch of culture that they're taking with them into this new faith, this new expression, this the Messiah who has come. They're giving up some things that they used to depend on and now are asked to depend on something else that's not seen. They used to depend on going to the temple and having a sacrifice made and then saying, oh, we're free. Our sin has been forgiven. Now they're asked to simply say, Jesus, forgive me. And that the sacrifice is no longer met, is no longer necessary. They no longer need to go to the temple. They're asked to believe. But as people throughout history, the Jews have a history of constantly turning away from what God is inviting them into and turning back to what they were in. They were slaves. He says, I'll make you free. They want to return as slaves. He says, I'll give you a land. They go, it's too scary. We don't want to go in it. We want to stay here. They get in the land. He says, you don't need to depend on chariots and horses and armies. Depend on me. And they build chariots and horses. Well, they don't build horses. They buy a lot of horses, breed a lot of horses, and they build strongholds. And God says, that will not protect you. I, the Lord God, will. Believe in me. And they go, well, maybe if we, this God of the people that we over, overthrew here that got us this land, maybe if we worship that God along with you, then we kind of have both. And God says, no, I am the lone, your, alone your God. Worship no other gods except for me. So here the author is expressing concern and also frustration that the commitment, these are chosen people who know the history of God being with them and for them, who now know that Jesus is the Messiah and have said, we want to follow him. That they're stuck. They're not moving forward. They say, this is what we should be doing, but they never get to doing. And the author becomes frustrated and also concerned that when you get stuck, you often then turn away from God and what he's inviting you into and turn back to what you know. The treasure of your heart changes from God to something that you think you can control. Let's jump at Hebrews, right? Chapter 5, starting in verse 11. There's much more we would like to say about this. This is the, the author's, right? But it's difficult to explain, especially since you're spiritual, spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You've been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still, for someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. 
And so, God willing, we will move forward to further understanding. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it's useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. This is verse 9 of chapter 6. Dear friends, because that was pretty rough, right? That was hard. If it wasn't hard for you, it was hard as I read it. Because we have moments where we go, I'm probably, I probably really need to hear this. Because I'm not doing the things of a mature Christian. I'm doing the things of an immature Christian. I'm expecting to hear the same fundamental things over and over again because I will not believe them so that my life will be transformed into a mature Christian. Verse 9, dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We are confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers, as you still do. Our great desire is that you'll keep on loving others as long as life lasts, in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. So we always ask a couple of questions. Due to our time together, I'm going to kind of run through these, but I do want you to think about, if there's some questions, write them down. If you have some answers to these questions, Write them down. So when I ask the question, what does this tell us about God? Think about that. You're going to hear me say, these are some things I think it tells us about God, but you may have some other things. Hold those and then look back at this verse later and say, is that true? And do I need to reflect on it more? So there's some basic things I think it tells us about God, this verse. Number one is that it says, Basic faith includes repenting and believing. And I think I can ask, do you believe in repenting and believing? And you guys would say, yes, that's a good thing. Do we exercise it in every circumstance? <sighs> right? It's hard to say I'm sorry. It's hard to say, please forgive me. It's hard, sometimes even more hard, to go to God and say, I failed again. Please forgive me. It also tells us that God is not unjust. He's not unfair. In fact, if he is unfair, he's unfair because we should get a lot worse treatment. But he declares that he'll forget our sins. He'll forget us trying to strike out independence from him and instead invite us back into that dependence of life and blessing with him. The other thing I heard as I read through this was that he doesn't forget the good we do. This can hit you. This is supposed to hit you hard. When we're talking about full commitment to Christ, if any one of you said, I'm there, 
that would be a red flag to me that I probably need to have a serious conversation with you because I think you're seeking independence by announcing that you're fully committed. Because as Luther said, the process is not finished. So the first thing that we do in the morning is stop and we go, Lord, the process isn't finished. Thank you for helping me seek you today. The other thing that I see is that he sees when you care for others, especially other believers. And I believe I could probably come up with a story with everybody here when you have cared for another believer. And sometimes we dismiss that in the church, and I don't want us to. It is a good thing when you see that David needs help, and you help David. It's a good thing when Terry says, and she wouldn't ask for help. But when she needs help, you step in and you help her. It's a beautiful thing. And it's not just for us to go, oh, it's a beautiful thing. That's a nice thing to do. God says, I don't forget it. I hope that encourages you. When you experience God, you experience good things. That's the other thing this section tells us. When you seek him, he changes you and you see good things that you didn't even realize were good. So what does it tell us about us? I think one thing is that we forget so easily and we need to be taught again and again. Imagine Priscilla and Aquila coming to this group of Jews, and this was a letter to be passed around from Jewish community to Jewish community to Jewish community. And the reason why it was passed around because they were coming and engaging with these groups, these Christian groups who were mostly Jews, and they're experiencing the same thing. They teach the fundamentals, and they would come back in a couple months and they go, Have you been repenting and believing? And they'd say, ah, and then they'd say, have you been baptizing? And they'd go, ah, have you been sharing your faith? Ah, right. Have you been reading his word and sharing his word? Oh. And so there's a bit of frustration with Priscilla and Aquila. And the frustration isn't that you're not doing what I'm telling you to do, so I'm upset. It's a spiritual concern frustration that you're missing out on this blessing that God wants to give you. We saw the research that I shared with you. You've heard me, you've heard Rob, you've heard other leaders go, read your Bible daily. In my 20 years plus of being a pastor, you know how many times people go, I've been engaged in the Bible daily? It's heartbreaking. Because guess what's on the other side of that? When you engage with Jesus, there's life transformation. When your heart treasure is in other things, that's where your heart's going to be. What else does it tell us about us? Oh, this is a quote from Luther. I almost forgot this. I had two quotes from Luther because, you know, huge church historian. We need to hear the gospel every day because we forget it every day. So quickly. The other thing it tells about us is that there's so much about God that we haven't even begun to learn. What they're talking about here in Hebrews is we keep repeating the same things to you because we keep forgetting the gospel every day. But there's so much more to God that you have yet to discover. And we'd love to engage in that as well. The other thing, and this is a hard one, this would probably create a little controversy and it would be actually a great um, table discussion and I'd love to have it. But you may have to just have it at home. 
It's difficult, if not impossible, for those who know God and then reject him to return. Those are verses 4 through 8 in chapter 6. That is a hard thing to hear. It's hard to hear, and then there's some things that I thought right away, well, what about the prodigal son parable? Jesus seems to indicate that here he was in a family, he rejects the family, he goes off, he's invited back into the family, Henry returns. The problem with that is that I think the Hebrews is being a little bit more general. There's not too many prodigal sons. And that's a hard truth for us to just hold on to. So when someone receives the gospel and then rejects the gospel, there are stories, absolutely. It doesn't mean that the moment you have a family member that grew up in the church and had the gospel preached to them and they said, yay, and then they totally reject it and walk away, that there's no hope for them. But there are not multiple and normal everyday stories of that happening. Now, there are people who it has nothing to do with attending church. Just get that in your mind. Sometimes we get that conflicted. Someone who rejects the gospel says, I no longer believe in Jesus. He has, I grew up with it. I don't want that. That's a rejection. Those are the individuals that Hebrews is talking about. And when you talk about a prodigal son, we're talking that Jesus says, there's always hope when you hope in me. But I think Hebrews is saying, look, the odds are not in the favor of those who reject. The last thing I think it tells us about us is that we're meant to be disciples. We're, we're meant to be that. It's not something outside of us to never attain or only the people that are leaders, quote unquote, in the church. Everyone who believes in Jesus is called to be a disciple. To become a little Christ. To follow him. To be transformed to be fully committed. So when I ask the question, where do we hear encouragement or conviction? So I think this hits us as an American church very directly. One is that we're not, so this is where it's hard to relate. Most of us don't have a Jewish heritage. So we're not trying to return to a sacrificial system. We're not trying to be, you know, how can we do this? return to the faith that we had. But one of the things that we do is that we seek things other than Jesus to bring happiness and peace. We seek things in the past that give us a moment of peace or a moment of happiness, and then it fades. When we hit those rough times, we go back to those things instead of returning to Christ who gives us complete peace. So we oftentimes have consumerism over contentment. Rather than being generous with what the Lord has given us, we find our contentment in buying other things. If we can have this, if we can have that, maybe this will make me happy. We have ambition seeking identity and purpose. So we look, we work really hard. We work and we work and we work hoping that someone will notice how hard we're working. We strive to be the best in our career. We try to get the gold star at the end when we're finished. But at the same time, we don't have the same courage to share the story of Jesus. 
I know that's hard. This is conviction. We do this with our children. We strive. We go to things. We give them lessons. We do everything we can. We hire tutors. We do whatever we can for their success. And at the same time, We don't sit down and pray with them. It's hard. It's conviction. It's also in the conviction is there's addictions of all kinds that we turn to. So we dull our hearts and our brokenness. We just try to numb it instead of facing it with Jesus. We look for anything so that we don't have to talk about it. When Jesus is sitting right there and it's telling you, you can share any burden you have. You can share any fear. He looks at Yvonne and he says, I love you so much. Your life has always been with me. And it always will be. And I know everything so you can share anything. And at the same moment, we often go, but not right now, Jesus. Do you feel convicted? Really, do you feel convicted? I hope so. I mean, that was my intent. (laughs) I hope you feel convicted. I feel convicted. Because God wants more for you. He wants more for you than just stay in your conviction and go, oh man, I'm a horrible Christian. Oh, I am, one, I am that person. I'm the person that seeks everything but Jesus when something happens. Until I can't seek anything else and then I seek Jesus. But there's a closing in this where he says, and this is where the encouragement comes. You're not this. You're not this. I hope you hear this right now. You are not this. Even if you're this yesterday, guess I don't care about yesterday because today can be a new day. You are not this. He says in verse 9, dear friends, even though we're talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We are confident that you're meant for better things, things that come with salvation. Met for better things. In your deepest conviction, I want you to hear that you are meant for better things. In your deepest addiction, I want you to hear this, you are meant for better things. In your worst day, I want you to hear you are meant for better things. What you think is great is nothing compared to what God thinks and has for you. I want you to think, the first question I asked you this morning in our confession and absolution is, what is the most important thing to you? And for those of you that said Jesus is the most important thing, amen. If your mind was going back and forth and going, my kids, my job. He has something better. He has something better. That greatest joy that you have, even if it's so, you know, something that you would never say, like college football is my greatest joy. I can relate to that. I can relate to that. I get it. In those moments, you're so excited. And maybe your kid has succeeded at, gets 100 on their spelling test, and they've never gotten 100. And they bring home the thing, and you rejoice with them. He has something better than that. Now, grab onto that feeling that you had during that time. God has something better planned for you than that greatest joy. Your wedding day, better for you than that. The birth of your first child, better than that. A promotion at work, better than that. 
That's who our God is. You're meant for greater things. And these things are not random. They're connected to salvation. Because guess what? The things that we think are great are not so great. But when your mind is transformed by the renewing of Christ, he reveals things that are great in this life and everlasting. Because faith in Jesus changes our hearts. And we become like little, ch little Christ's where we start to value the things that Jesus values. We begin to love the Lord our God with all our heart, Rosalinda, and we love our neighbors as ourselves because he has better things planned. And I want to give you a picture of that right now as we close up. Yes, we can be dull. Yes, we can be stuck. Yes, we can enjoy conflict more than peace. Yes, we can be involved in all the things that are going wrong instead of finding the things that God is doing that are right. Yes, we can complain instead of giving thanks. Yes, we can worry instead of believe that the God who's always been there for us will surely come through. And that is the invitation that he's giving. That's the invitation Hebrews is giving to us today. That you're not these saints. Maybe you were yesterday. But today we declare we are not these things. We are not these people who are dull and indifferent and uncommitted. We are changing because of the love of Christ. We're ready to be committed. We're ready for the good things he has in store. We're ready for our minds to be transformed. Amen and amen.